you know, I feel like I I know uh, UVU. We've we've got one of your rock stars in our office, Trista Messenger, uh, who's just an incredible architect. She uh, is very valued in our office, and you know, speaks very highly of this program. So it was an honor to be able to come down here and, and speak to you all. And it was a lot of fun to be able to spend this afternoon just messing around, you know, drawing, just uh, having a good time, just um, looking at the landscape and seeing what we saw. Um, so did all of y'all write that down? Also, there's going to be a test on that quote later. <laughs> um, so, you know, who is this man? No, it's not my father. Um, it's an artisan, a craftsman, and you see he's smiling. And why is he smiling? Yeah, this is a man who is fulfilled. Uh, he's a man who gets to work with his hands, his heart, and his mind. His spirit can connect on a human to human level. He knows that that Ikea piece in your living room will be thrown out in three years, but the piece that he built by hand will be treasured forever. And his spirit will live with you through that time that you live with that piece. So I grew up, so this book is about drawing. It's about the idea that architects are craftsmen and drawing has always been the architect's craft. Uh, today in this world, you know, where we have so many computers, it, they're important tools. Nobody can deny that. You use them on a daily basis in your studies. But what is largely forgotten in a lot of the architectural programs today, and by most architects today, is the importance of drawing. Um, this idea that uh, drawing is what we've always been as architects, and has always been a part of the architectural profession. So, uh, going back, I grew up in West Texas, and there was an Indian legend of the great creator who after creating West Texas, took all of his trash and threw it to the far reaches of West Texas. Um, yeah, it was a place that was very special to me, this, this landscape. This is, a, this is a painting by Dennis Blagg, and this painting's probably 16 feet high by 32 feet long. And when I stand in front of this, this painting, my childhood comes back to me. You know, I can smell the ozone in the air. I can feel the cool wind in my face, the sun on my back. I can smell the sage. It takes me back to a place in time. So the buildings that remain still embody our history. It became who I am as a Texan. It became part of me as an individual. Not only as history, but of lore and mythology. And how these buildings were built of the land and were built from the land. In 2022, I was a Robert A. M. Stern visiting professor of classical architecture at Yale. And we created a course called The Land Between Borders, which was a study on the cultural influences on architecture in the area of Texas that was not Texas and not Mexico until the Spanish-American Wars, this land between, uh, that had this incredible diversity of culture, an incredible diversity of landscape, and an incredible diversity of architecture. So we traveled 1,400 miles from the Rio Grande near the coast, all the way out to West Texas and Marfa and beyond to El Paso, following the Rio Grande. We're exploring the many cultural influences of Texas. And in doing so, I handed each student a sketchbook. And this doesn't sound like a big deal even after today, but believe it or not, programs like Yale don't require drawing. And so for many of the students that I was teaching, these were graduate students getting ready to graduate and go out to their careers, they had never drawn. 
Uh, and certainly none of them had ever drawn the landscape or an understanding of the cultural influences that these buildings, that influenced these, these buildings so highly. And so I handed each of these students a sketchbook and told them they must fill it up before the end of the journey. And so with those sketchbooks, they learned to observe and to draw and to see and to begin to understand the relationship of man and his buildings to the landscape. These are drawings from those travels. We began to understand material and understand how the twisted tree and how that tree became a lintel and how that lintel becomes a building. So every place we went, we brought these sketchbooks and we sketched precedent and we sketched landscape and we brought these lessons back to the studio with us and began to draw the projects. And what's interesting, somebody was asking me this earlier, did, because I draw so much, did the students in the class draw? And nobody else at, at Yale were, were using hand drawing in their studios. But after using these sketchbooks through this entire journey, the majority of the class came back and drew these projects by hand. So in my childhood, my love of drawing came from my Aunt Margaret. You know, she was a, a wonderful watercolorist and would send these cards, uh, which were very special to us as, as, as kids. And we would take these long walks down the end of old Galveston Highway uh, that was abandoned long after the bridge had burned down. And it was this old shell road that went off into the swamps. And we would walk down with her old Dalmatian and look into the swamp. And she would show me, show me how to see. You know, she would pick out the orchids hanging from the trees or the alligator nests or the birds. She would show that this was much more than just a swamp. It was a beautiful landscape. And so growing up in West Texas, my father would get these journals called the Humble Travel Journal. He worked for Humble Oil at the time. And in these journals were these traveling watercolors by Buck Schweitz. And Buck would do these wonderful watercolors of the historic towns of Texas. And I would go through these journals, and they were incredibly influential to me. And so romantic and understanding the Texas landscape and the buildings that occupied it. But it wasn't until I got to Texas Tech that I realized that there was this junction between art and architecture. Uh, there was this periodical uh, that was called the AA that was a journal out of Europe. And in that journal was a watercolor by Abdel Wahid El Wakil. And it just captivated me that how simple, how poetic, how soft this watercolor was, how artistic, but yet it captured the essence of this building. So what about art in general? This is a 15th century Botticelli as allegorical art. It's a palimpsest. It's layers of cultural memory and meaning erased and rewritten time and time again. Memories on top of realities, on top of memories. Renaissance on top of Florentine, on top of medieval, on top of Rome. And so the American identity was initially shaped at this time by the European identity. We use our European landscapes and mythologies as a basis for our own art. This is Thomas Cole's Course of an Empire. But that all changed in 1836. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote a short book called Nature. It was the number one best-selling book in American history at the time. And it was based on transcendentalism. This idea that we were at one with nature and that nature is as close to God as we come to in life. And it instructs us 
in every moment we live. In the 17th century, age of enlightenment, Immanuel Kant said of transcendentalism that we can only have knowledge through those things we experience. Human understanding is based on an understanding shaped by the laws of nature. And Descartes believed consciousness is a reflection of the material world. I think, therefore I am. American artists of the Hudson River School painted the American landscape. Here, human beings and nature coexisted, where poetic and artistic inspiration found no impediments, abandoning rationalism for emotion and feeling. Where landscapes rise like great cathedrals into the realms of light where the deity seems to reside. A primordial image of American wholeness. The ideal relationship between humanity and all-powerful nature. Nature as God's refuge to the poet hero and the idea that by observing, by seeing, one will know God and one will know truth. America was vast and full of possibilities, and this view of ourselves shaped a nation, a nation of brotherhood, humanity, and ecology. It showed that natural, natural majesty during a time of American expansionism and searched for the balance of human expansion and the preservation of nature. They saw the manifestation of God in nature. And this painting by Moran of Yellowstone so touched the American spirit of who we are, it created our first national park. Now, I was just in Washington about three weeks ago, and I was able to go to the Portrait Museum where this painting hangs. And it is actually about the size that it shows on the screen there. And you can imagine you know, these people on the East Coast who had never stepped foot out west standing before this painting imagining the grandeur of our country and what it meant. Other aspects of our society, such as the tempest of the Civil War, were expressed by artists like Winslow Homer, as well as the bridges that we could create after the war. But for Homer, it was not about what he was seeing. It was about a constant and obsessive search. American artists carried this tradition into the 20th century. Here we see an N.C. Wyeth. And what John Ruskin called measuring the moods of nature. I, I have to just say this quickly. I, you know, Linda Bean uh, was a client of ours, of LLB. And I was in Maine one time, and I called her up, and I said, I'm, I'm here, I was wondering if you wanted to have a cup of coffee. And she said, sure, show up at the pier at 8 o'clock, sharp. And so I go down to the pier in Port Clyde, and here comes this lobster boat just speeding across the way from the island out in the distance. It comes roaring up to the, the dock, pulls up, perfect docking maneuver, and it's Linda Bean herself, 82 years old. <laughs> and you know, she said, hop in, and she takes me out to her island where she has this 18th century house sitting in the hill. And it, on this island, in her kitchen, she has this drawing of about two dozen spots on the island with names of different Wyeth family artists and the location where they painted famous paintings. And when you stand in her hallway and look at this painting, and then you turn left and look out her front door, this island sits out in the view. It was just incredible. So you know, these group of artists on the East Coast were studying that intersection of the forces of where the sea met the land and how that shaped the American culture. In Mohegan, Maine, there was a, a particular art colony that members such as Rockwell Kent, Edward Hopper, all of the generations of the Wyatts, George Bellows and others, all gathered 
to paint during the summers, to paint this scene of American life. It was interesting that George Bellows once said, an architect that cannot draw is merely a mechanic. Mm. Now, this is Edward Hopper, who saw the landscape not as a collection of objects, but of blocks of color. Edward Hopper's aesthetic strategies are what's called synesthesia, or cross-century imagery. That ability, what Walter Wells calls of artists, to have us taste what we see, hear what we feel, to give colorful, odorful color, melodious flavor, or a chill wind perceived as a wailing siren or quivering blue light. What if architects could see this way? Hopper was known as the poet of science, silence, and was able not only to paint places, but the loneliness of a place. What if architects could design buildings that captured our emotions? John Ruskin used to say, to draw was to gain an empirical knowledge, an understanding through experiencing. To draw the leaf was to know the forest. John Calvin Stevens was an amazing architect on the East Coast, a main architect, and was largely responsible for creating America's first architectural style, the shingle style. But he was also a painter. And he would not only paint the landscapes for the sake of art, but it became an almost ceremonial scene of the site. So John Calvin Stevens was such a good architect that Winslow Homer asked him to design his studio. And so this is Winslow Homer's studio on the rocks in Prout's Neck. And so Winslow Homer, instead of taking a fee, asked one thing of Winslow Homer, can I have a painting? And so this is the painting that Winslow Homer gave him for his dues. So John Calvin Stephen was a huge enthusiast of painting and drawing. He would ask all his friends, do you sketch? There will be no shortage of opportunity to improve your skills. And so he recruited architects like Ralph, William Ralph Emerson and Robert Swain Peabody of Peabody and Stearns. And they would travel across to Europe and would travel up and down the East Coast, painting and drawing together. And this highly influenced their architecture. Some of the first architecture to be married with the landscape on which it's set. And there were other artist architects. There was Charles Platt, who changed his placard from artist to architect. And he first developed the first measured drawings of the Italian gardens, and went on to work for Frederick Law Olmsted. Platt would become America's most celebrated architect of the time. But here we see some of his paintings from when he studied at the Academy Julian in Paris as a painter. In Boston, this idea that architects should draw art and science formed America's first architecture school. MIT, with Samuel Chamberlain as the professor of drawing. Here he taught, among others, Arnold Brunner, who was eventually assigned to the US Commission of Fine Arts, among others. And this idea of drawing as architects became the nexus for architectural firms on the East Coast. And they had these American journals that encouraged drawing and documenting travel abroad. There was pencil points from the University of Pennsylvania called the Journal of the Drafting Room. And members contributed studies constantly where drawing and how we observe was the nucleus of practice. And learning the language of a place was the basis for knowledge and architecture. The scene. 
and the understanding and the knowing. Cass Gilbert was one of the uh, students of Samuel Chamberlain at MIT. And at the University of Pennsylvania, Julia Francis Abel was the first black American to graduate architecture school. <coughs> and another University of Pennsylvania grad, John Kell, who eventually went on to work for Paul Cray, had a desk mate, Louis Kahn. And when things got tight in the 30s, then they had to let staff go. Louis Kahn was let go and John Kell stayed on. Well, I had the privilege of meeting John Kell when I first moved back to Texas and went to work for an architectural firm there. John Kell was this 80-something-year-old man back in the back of the drafting room, checking shop drawings, redlining drawings. He never spoke of this ability to draw or the fact that he was a celebrated student from the University of Pennsylvania and traveled Europe drawing. It wasn't until after he passed that his family discovered all these drawings because architecture had changed and no longer valued drawing. So MIT graduate John Galen Howard would go on to form the architectural program at Berkeley. Here, he would teach luminaries like Julia Morgan, the first woman to attend the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris, Bernard Maybeck, and Mary Coulter, who defined the architecture of the West with her railroad hotels and national park lodges. And Bertram Goodhue left New York to travel up to Boston, where he would become a member of the Society of Arts and Crafts. Soon he would catch a train down to Texas and cross the Rio Grande. He would write a book called Sojourn South of the Yellow Rio Grande, chronicling his studies in Mexico. He would return to the United States, but not the East Coast. He would go west, and his timing was impeccable because he would, sur he would supplant Irvin Gill as the architect for the 1915 Pan American Exhibition. And it would be the first time that a regional architecture, an architecture influenced by landscape and culture, would shape the idea of a place. Interesting enough, George Washington Smith, who was also an artist who studied at the Academy Julianne in Paris, would show his painting at the exhibition. It would be the first time he would go to California. He would often exhibit with George Bellows. But after finding California, he would set up his own studio in Santa Barbara. And immediately, the landed gentry loved his studio so much that they would ask him to design their own homes. Uh, for the book, I looked high and low for this painting to see if I could include it in the book and tracked it down to an art gallery and said, well, we just sold that, that piece to a private owner, Barbara. And I said, could you please give me their name so I can ask them for copyrights to put it in the book? And they said, no, we, we can't divulge into that. And lo and behold, I was in Santa Barbara about a month ago interviewing contractors and walking through a house that they had just completed and turned a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting enough, George Washington Smith went on to be one of the most celebrated architects of Southern California, but didn't do a lot of his architectural drawings. He would leave that to Ludo Maria Riggs, who was a talented architect within his office. This is typical of her drawings. This happens to be a house that George Washington Smith designed in San Antonio, Texas. He would go on to help shape the identity of Santa Barbara after the 1925 earthquake and redesign the city to reflect this idea of 
the cultural heritage of Southern California. Another architect involved with that shaping was Lionel Preece, a much younger architect at the time. Uh, he would go on to design many of the buildings and have them built. Lionel Preece did his time roaming around Europe, sketching, drawing, and seeing. But he was also deeply influenced by culture and landscape. Here is a painting of his in Guanajuato. And he would go on to become the director of the Seattle Institute of Fine Arts. Heavily influenced by Giorgio O'Keefe and Leonard Marston. So, what does drawing mean to me? You know, we all carry around this modern device in our hand, and it's so easy just to capture images. But that's just it, they're, they're captured. And we take them back to our computer, we download them, and we put them in a file. And maybe we'll recall those images up sometime. It's not the same as when you're drawing and the response to what you're drawing. Once I draw something, it goes into my bank of memory. It becomes a part of who I am as an architect. It becomes a part of the experience. Here you see a very quick sketch arriving in Venice at 2 a.m. because I couldn't sleep because of the jet lag. And then the next morning, doing a more studied sketch. Villa Rotunda, in Benita. And so this idea that traveling and seeing the landscapes and studying as those architects before me could help shape me as an architect, help form my practice and how I see architecture today. And not only in landscape, but in culture as well. Yeah, but when I paint a drawing like this, when I'm sitting on a rock, I remember it was 102 degrees. And I remember the buzz of electricity of the crickets in the field. And I know where I was. This is Provence. It's a little um, tube stop in Soho Square, London. Um, late night sketch from a balcony in Athens, church in the Bahamas, a dovecote from France that ended up influencing one of our designs. And so these landscapes end up teaching me how to think about architecture, helping me understand how to design the place. Here is a ranch that we designed in far north Texas. Uh, the client wanted a tower so that he could go up and watch what we call these blue northers drift across the plain. But then he wanted a safe room to run down to in case there was a tornado. Um, but he conveniently had that double up as a wine cellar. <laughs> Uh, here's a quick sketch uh, of a site in West Texas, uh, looking back to where the house would sit, and then looking out from the house and what the view would be. And then the conceptual sketch of that house sitting in that landscape, and how that house was eventually realized. Here's a quick sketch. I was telling somebody I have a larger sketchbook that I sometimes do these landscapes in. This is that sketchbook. This is Moosehead Lake in Maine, the clouds drifting over the lake. And then the lake house that we designed, looking out onto that view. Here's the views that actually exist. And the view of the house as it looks out. This was just announced yesterday that this is a Palladio Award winner. So we're very pleased. <laughs> and 
And so it's about this connection to that landscape that makes the house belong and be a part of it. It's a landscape a couple of hours west of San Antonio and the house that we designed in it. And the materiality connecting to the landscape, the forms connecting to the landscape. Centering an inner courtyard. And the materials, all of which we determined had to be selected for what could come from the ranch itself, either oak or mesquite or pecan, in this case cypress. Uh, the, the log columns you see here were dredged from the local river. The interior of the space, the living room, and how that living room looked out onto that original landscape view. Some of the interior spaces. It's a library that was crafted out of 2,000 year old cypress. It was dredged from the bottom of a river and a solid oak staircase that winds up to the loft and down to a wine cellar. And a small little cabin we designed up on the bluff to look down upon the house. Here's a landscape in Aspen looking at Mount Hayden in Castle Creek. And how as you walk into the living room, that view is captured. <coughs> and so these landscapes not only become influential, not only become ceremonious in how we see them, but actually this is Wasatch Mountains here for a study for a project. But they inform every move we make in the architecture that we design and how we marry that architecture with its place so that it belongs. Here was my first concept for a studio in Maine. Um, didn't quite make it, but it was an idea. A sketchbook. Uh, this is a house overlooking a ravine in West Texas. And how the watercolors not only are an illustration, but try to capture the character of the landscape and the quality of the painting themselves. This is Santa Barbara. Uh, so often we use uh, sequential sketches to give this idea of procession through a site. And here you see, um, as you drive down the road, what you're anticipated to see next, and you come upon another building, and then the next, and then the next. And sometimes these drawings can be dozens of drawings to lead the client through um, the sequence of what they'd be experiencing. Uh, this is the stable for that particular project. Beautiful drawing by Drew Gander in our office. Uh, some of y'all follow Drew on Instagram. He does beautiful drawings. A watercolor of the elevation of this stable. And then Drew's aerial perspective of the house as it sits in the river. And then this is another young man, Sam Hussle. In this particular project, the house sits adjacent to a state park in Texas, across, uh, overlooking a scenic river. And so, looking for inspiration, I walked the banks of the river and I saw this old cypress that just clung to every rock to hold it in place as the water rushed by. And then this is the design for the house itself. We're looking to bluff. Jim Linehan's drawing of the interior. And Sam Russell again, as the house steps down the bluff, looking to the view. We do a lot of charrettes. Um, we really enjoy these. This is a very quick idea of, of being able to get a project out and the essence out uh, very quickly to show a client 
um, a, a concept to be able to inform the schematic design later. Uh, this particular drawing, I, I arrived at the site in Spain at 2 a.m., couldn't sleep again because of jet lag, went out on the back porch and uh, did a quick painting of the Spanish village on the hillside and a glow of its city lights. And then the next day, did a design for uh, a series of housing units in an adjacent village. Uh, here's a, a charrette watercolor of housing in Scotland. This one's in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Matt White's painting. Uh, a hotel on an island in the Bahamas. And then so we see how these sketches begin to inform. We talked earlier today about how if you can draw, if you can escape being a prison of the machine and can think fluently in the language of drawing, how quickly you can imagine things and get them down on paper. So during the charrette, this is a quick conceptual sketch of a seminary we were doing in North Carolina. This is the schematic design of that seminary as it developed and developed further. Mac White's study of the tower and his study of the interior of the chapel. So phase one was built and we are working on the chapel now as we speak, hopefully to get started in construction this fall. A conceptual sketch of a sorority house at the University of Arkansas during you know, a, a quick hairy charrette. And then how that turned into the schematic designs. And then the building itself. So the reason why I'm showing you these, I want, I want to be able to express the seed of the idea that comes out very quickly in being able to brainstorm and how that seed of the idea is carried through every integral process to end up with the final idea. But it's the same idea. It's a conceptual sketch for sorority headquarters in Ohio. Uh, this is the Linda Bean Center that uh, we're just wrapping up in Delaware. This was during the, the charrette and then the final schematic design. Sometimes we're asked to go on charrettes just to develop an architectural language for a place. Uh, this is in Windsor, Florida. A very quick 20 minute sketch. Uh, this is a schematic design for a house in Costa Rica and how that rendering ended up being realized in the actual built house. It's a project in Montana we've been working on. These are stables and woods. Arrival at the main house. And then the main lodge as it looks out over Glacier National Park. Very stable. And the little hands on Gretel guest cottage. <laughs> Uh, this is a current project we're working on in, in St. Augustine, Florida for a church campus. Another technique for a ranch house in, in uh, North Boston, Texas. It's Drew Gander's <coughs> conceptual sketch for the courtyard. And so talking about this quick succession of ideas, teasing out the idea, these are very quick sketches and the initialization of trying to get, capture this germ of an idea that can move forward to the idea of the actual architecture be developed as the architecture. So this is in Telluride, Colorado. You know, trying to marry this lodge with the hilltop that it sits on. You're looking out towards the view of the Dallas Mountains. And then this is my pencil rendering what the house would look like looking out to the view. 
house we recently finished in Pasadena, California. And these aren't professional shots, these are just iPhone shots of the, the finished house. If you have to photograph it yet. It's a very quick study in my sketchbook. It's probably a 10 minute study of a pile of rocks overlooking the Sea of Cortez, which would be in the middle of our view, looking out from this house that we were designing. And so that inspired us to look at this house in a way that it's not just a floor plan that you're occupying, but this is this idea of, of entering and going through and arriving and going up and in and around and on top of and in would end up inspiring the design for this house. This is the view looking towards the Sea of Cortez, the entry, and then the courtyard, and then the house itself. This will be an architectural digest this summer. The entry, and then arrival into the courtyard. And that interaction with the architecture of going up and round and through. And on top of and within. And so some of y'all heard about our little whiskey watercolor club that we have. There's there's five architects that got together during the pandemic. We, uh, all like to travel together and one time we decided to bring our watercolors and started painting. Um, our, our first big trip was, was to India where we really said, okay, we're going to be serious about painting this time. And so uh, we left for India amongst this, this news of this new um, pandemic that was beginning to hit everywhere. And, you know, I arrived in New York to take the flight to India with my family and my wife and daughter called a meeting and said, you know, we're not going and my son and I said, yes we are. <laughs> and so they stayed and I went on, you know, my son and I went on with our friends. And so, you know, we, we spent time watercoloring while we were there and enjoying the culture. <laughs> Uh, but really getting an understanding in a sense for place. This is a very quick watercolor. I was showing somebody the technique of using a sepia pen and just uh, taking watercolor and letting it smear and be loose you know, versus a more studied watercolor. This is a hilltop fortress in Rajasthan. Some of the town markets, village markets. And so this pandemic they were speaking of got worse and worse until finally they announced that they were shutting down travel. And so we ended up catching uh, the last flight out to Newark and, and ended up you know, escaping in time. And these friends of ours, you know, it was two architects from New York, an architect from Washington, D.C., and an architect from Chicago said, you know, why don't we just keep painting together? You know, we're, we're shutting down the offices, we've got Zoom. And so we said, next Sunday, let's, let's paint together over Zoom. And so four years later, we're still painting most Sundays together over Zoom. And so when we paint together, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll choose like a John Singer Sargent and say, you know, how did he capture the essence of light coming through the canvas, the glow of light? And so this is my copy of the John Singer Sargent trying to understand through his eyes. Or Francis McComas and his blocks of color. Or an Augustus Osborne Lampo and the quality of a desert atmosphere. We would often paint the same painting. This is, this is Hugh, Hugh Falls by Fitz Dallo. And three different interpretations. 
Uh, we thought the pandemic was lightening up, so we ran out to San, uh, Santa Fe. It, it proved to be a, a, a false relief. The pandemic came back, and we were all back in our houses again. But, and you know, we were talking also about this idea of understanding the atmosphere you're in. Yeah, it was funny, we were out in the desert of Santa Fe and you would brush something onto your paper and go back to the palette and your palette would be dry already. <laughs> and then, you know, versus being in England where you see the drips on the page because nothing ever dry. <laughs> and this is actually in Ireland last year where it was actually raining on the paper. Oh, so learning to paint quickly in all sorts of atmosphere. And so I didn't get my tower studio, but just part of the pandemic, I'd added on this studio to my house in Maine. And so it, it finally gave me this place where I could focus on painting for the first time in my life. And so here you see a painting just outside my studio window, capturing the birch trees and moss the local quarry, the local lighthouse, and scenes around the island. And exploring what watercolor can do as a medium. But also learning. You know, learning about refracted light, learning about you know, the tent of a shadow on the side of a building. You're know, learning about transparency. This was Linda Bean's little dinghy uh, painted. And so for the first time, I really began to understand what I can learn from painting in my architecture, how it can teach me more about my architecture and then understanding material and light and shadow and atmosphere. And so this idea, this importance of drawing as part of our culture in our office. We have what we call the MGIA Sketch Club where every Friday morning uh, members of the office get together and they spend just 15, 20 minutes doing a sketch. And those sketch will comprise of a different lesson. Sometimes it's just drawing a tree. Sometimes it's emulating um, Samuel Chamberlain. Sometimes it's, it's studying uh, texture techniques or pencil techniques or composition. It's Mac White in our office, some of his sketches. These are simple 15 minute sketches. More study drawings by Jim Linehan. And then one of Jim's interiors for a current project in Ohio. In the site. And so here's a current project in California. Uh, we have a site that has an almost 360 degree view from the top. But how did you marry this to this landscape, this incredible landscape of California? And so by sitting out there on the site, by sketching it, I began to feel the site, I began to understand it. And it begins to inform me on the layout of the buildings and the structures of the house and the garden and the sequence of the spaces and the way you capture space and the way you open up onto views interior sketch. Here's what I drew Gander's sketches of a master plan for a college in Michigan. And actually this is one of his charrette sketches of a sequence moving up into Central Quad. And we're currently just starting design development on these buildings now for this campus. This is our design for what we call the Heritage Room, which is more or less the Campus Museum. And the new reading room for the Central Library. 
Uh, this is a project. This is actually, uh, this is not a painting. This is a computer rendering uh, where the guys in the office take textures from our watercolors and then apply them using uh, Photoshop. This is the new town center for Alice Beach in Florida that's now under construction. And so, what about computers and drawing? Um, yeah, this, this looks like one of those incredible, evocative paintings by William Walcott, the English painter from the 20s. It's not, this is AI. And so, yes, AI is yet another tool that we can use as architects. And it can create amazing effects and be quite evocative. But when I sit out on a site, what AI doesn't have is the ability for me to foot smell the cold wind coming off the mountain or feel the heat on my back or smell the cedar. That's why I draw. Thank you.